could we use enthalpy for a chemical potential? You guys remember what enthalpy is? <laughs> Something to do with heat. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, I think this was back in chapter six, maybe. So the change in enthalpy equals the change in internal energy plus the pressure times the change in volume. So this is a form of work, and that's a form of heat. So we got heat and work. Um, if, if the pressure is constant, then we can equate the change in enthalpy to Q at constant pressure. So that's the Q of Q equals MC delta T. You take something and you put energy into it and the temperature goes up. If it's done at constant pressure, the change in energy, the change in heat, is the same as the change in enthalpy. So we often think of enthalpy and heat as being the same thing, and they're very similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. Well, what if we used enthalpy for our chemical potential? Enthalpy predicts that all exothermic reactions are spontaneous, and all endothermic reactions are not spontaneous. Is that true? Apparently not. Apparently not, because it says no. Well, that's, that's no to this question. And then it says some endothermic reactions are spontaneous. Can you think of an endothermic reaction that's spontaneous? Energy going in. Ice melting. Ice melting. So I've got ice cubes in my rock star, and they're slowly melting. That requires energy to come in, right? Mm -hmm. Am I doing anything to make them melt? Yeah, you have it in a warm environment. No, they are in a warm environment. Well, it is in a warm environment, but is, is someone intervening in that? What about, what about um, one of those instant cold packs? you know, that the sports trainers have, and you break the little seal and you mix the chemicals together, what happens? It gets cold by sucking in heat from the surroundings. Spontaneous, right? So some endothermic reactions are spontaneous, some exothermic reactions are not spontaneous. So enthalpy is not the whole story. What could we use for chemical potential? Well, let's think about some spontaneous processes that involve an increase in enthalpy. They're ex endothermic. So, <coughs> excuse me, shouldn't have eaten those frogs for dinner. <coughs> the melting of ice above zero degrees Celsius, the ice is taking energy in from the surroundings, it's spontaneous. The evaporation of liquid water to gaseous water. If you have a beaker of water, the water is at room temperature, the room is at room temperature, but the water still evaporates. Evaporation is an endothermic process. Why does that happen spontaneously? And the dissolution of sodium chloride in water. What do those three things have in common? Water. Water. This is true. What else do they have in common? All the molecules are It has something to do with the arrangement of the molecules. So, actually, let me talk about this one. So, here we've got... And here's a little hint there, hiding in the corner. Increasing entropy. Here we've got the solid water, and all the, all the water molecules are arranged in this open crystalline pattern. And as it melts, what happens to the order of the water? Disordered. It gets disordered, right? Let's look at water evaporating. So here we have all of the water molecules in a small volume. They're very close together. As it evaporates, they spread out, and they get even more disordered. Let's think about sodium chloride dissolving. 
Here we have this lovely crystalline structure, alternating sodium and chloride ions, very ordered. When it dissolves, these ions are free to move about in the water. They become more disordered. In each of these three processes, disorder or randomness increases. And this is uh, related to a property called entropy. So we can say that entropy is the criterion for spontaneity in chemical systems. Entropy, a little bit like enthalpy, is one of those things that's a little hard to get your mind around what exactly it means. So we're going to try to do that. But informally, we can think of entropy as disorder or randomness. And so the entropy is increasing. That means it's a spontaneous process. Um, I have a, an entropy demonstration ongoing in my home. It's called Four Children Still Living in the House. And you can pick up the toys, and you can put them in the bins, and you can wash the dishes and put the silverware away and everything. But what happens? It all gets disordered. You turn your back, and every surface is covered with Legos or Nerf darts, depending on what day it is. So entropy happens behind you. Entropy happens behind you. Actually, it happens in front of you, too. Yeah. So it's related to randomness or disorder. So here is a more formal definition of entropy. And entropy has the symbol S. So, you know, I'd really like to talk to the people that came up with these things. H is enthalpy. E is internal energy. And S is whoops, entropy. What? Why? Why? I don't know. Oh, yeah, S can be solubility too. <laughs> but it's not C. C is for cookie. Okay, so entropy is a thermodynamic function that increases with the number of energy, energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components of a system to achieve a particular state. Well, that probably didn't make a lot of sense. Um, here's an equation for entropy. Entropy equals a constant K, which is called the Boltzmann constant, times the natural log of W. So the Boltzmann constant is the ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So it comes out to be 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. Um, w is a number of things, and so it doesn't have a unit. And so the units of entropy are joules per Kelvin. What is W? W is the number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components of the system. Okay, so there it is. Now let's try to figure out what that means. So imagine. Imagine a fixed amount of an ideal gas. We're going to have pressure, volume, and temperature all be constant. It's a fixed amount, so N is also constant. Okay, so really nothing is changing, right? So we can define the state of that system also known as the macro state, by looking at PV and T. So we can say, OK, we have one mole of gas. It's at STP. We have defined the macro state for that sample of gas. The energy of that system will be constant. We're not changing the temperature. We're not allowing it to do any work. The energy is going to be constant. So that's, that's very nice. But exactly where the energy is at any given instant is anything but constant because those gas molecules move around. And they have an average kinetic energy which is related to the temperature of the gas. But within that system, say we have one mole of gas, there's a lot of gas part molecules in there. They, they don't all have the same energy. Some of them have higher energy and some of them have lower energy and they're moving around. So a gas molecule at one instant could have high kinetic energy 
and an instant later it could have low kinetic energy because it ran into and transferred its energy to another particle. Does that make sense? This means yes, and this means no. Okay, I'm getting mostly up and down. So the microstate, micro is small, is the exact internal energy distribution among the particles in that sample at any given instant. So you could think of it as a snapshot. Where are all the particles? What are they doing at this instant? So you can have a given macrostate exist as a result of a large number of different microstates. The macrostate remains constant the microstate changes because the energy of the system is constantly redistributing itself among the particles of the system. So this one occurred to me as I was sitting under the cherry blossoming cherry tree, trying not to get too much dust in my computer. Um, I like the analogy of energy as money. So if you think about the United States and Overall, the total amount of money in the United States, relatively constant, right? Certainly pretty constant over the course of a day or two. But where is the money located? It changes, right? People make fortunes, people lose fortunes, and that can happen very quickly, you know, if you bought a winning lottery ticket, you could suddenly become rich. The total amount of money in the country remains the same, but where the money is moves around. Does that make sense? So macrostate is the amount of money in the country. Microstates is, well, where is that money? And there's a lot of different scenarios that could result in the same total amount of money. So that's what we're talking about, microstates and macrostates. So we can think of W as the number of possible microstates that could result in a given macrostate. So we're going to look at a very simple analogy, two simple analogies, really. So let's look at two systems that each contain two particles, keeping it simple, and they each have a total energy of four joules. So here's system A. It's got two particles. There's only one energy level, both the red particle, that's the blue one, both the red particle and the blue particle are at the same energy level. They're both at a level of 2 joules. The total energy is 4 joules. And then here's system B. System B also has two particles. The total amount of energy is 4 joules, but this has two levels. And so we can have the red one being at the 3 joule level and the blue one being at the 1 joule level. Or we could switch their positions. We could have blue being rich and red being poor, right? But the total amount of energy is the same. So the macrostate for this and this are the same. Do you see that? But the microstates are different because the different particle has the three joules in each of these. System B has two microstates. System A has one microstate. Therefore, system B has more entropy because it has more macrostate, I'm sorry, microstates. Any questions? It's important to get your head around it at this point. So the entropy of a state increases with the number of energetically equivalent ways to arrange the components to achieve that particular state. That's what we're talking about with putting the little balls at different energy levels, but still having the same total sum of energy. The state with the highest entropy, with the most ways of arranging the components, also has the greatest dispersal of energy. So the energy of system B is dispersed over two energy levels. Let's go back to the picture. The energy of system A is restricted to one level. The energy of system B is dispersed over two levels. The energy is more spread out, and so that, that system has more entropy. 
So a state in which a given amount of energy is more highly dispersed or more random has more entropy than a state in which the same energy is more highly concentrated. So this dispersal of energy is an important concept in entropy. Any questions? And that brings us to the second law of thermodynamics. For any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increases. Not the entropy of the system, the entropy of the universe. The energy of the universe is constant, disregarding nuclear processes. The entropy of the universe is increasing. And so we say that delta S universe is greater than zero. Delta meaning change in S ent entropy universe referring to the universe. So the change in entropy of the universe is greater than zero. And the criteria for, s for spontaneity is the entropy of the universe. So, you know, that's bad news for people who like things neat and tidy, right? Because the universe is becoming more disordered. Thankfully, it doesn't all have to do with visible objects. You can still tidy up your bedroom. So entropy is a state function. Remember, a state function, the value depends only on the state of the system, not on how the system got there. So change in elevation is a state function. Distance traveled, not a state function. So let's say I was going to leave here and go up to Grant Grove. And I could take, I could take 180 and, and drive up that way. Or I could go down down south through Visalia and come up Whitaker Forest Road. The distance I travel would be different. The elevation change between Fresno and Grant Grove is the same no matter how I got there. Entropy changes are state functions. It's just the first and the last. It's not, it has nothing to do with what happened in between. So delta S is the final entropy minus the initial entropy. And delta is always final minus initial. So let's look at another system. And we'll see that a chemical system proceeds in a direction that increases the entropy of the universe. That would be a spontaneous process. So we're going to look at an ideal gas expanding into a vacuum. So here we have a funky little setup of two round flasks and they're connected and this is a stopcock in the middle so we can close this or we can open it right now it's closed so over here we have four particles of gas right you know we don't want to get it too complicated this side is a vacuum there's no gas in there no pressure so when this gas expands into here, there's not going to be a pressure that it's expanding against, so it's not going to be doing any work. P delta V is going to equal zero because the pressure is zero. So the, in the process of doing that, the total energy of the system doesn't change, but the entropy will change. So when we open the stopcock, there's several different energetically equivalent states but we're only going to look at three of them. So well, here's the stopcock open. One possibility is that all four particles could remain on the left, in the left flask. Uh, that we'll call that A. B, all four particles move to the other side, to the other flask, and now we have none over here. And state C, we have two particles in each flask. What's another one that we're not looking at? One on the right, three on the left, one on the left, three on the right. We're going to ignore that one, those two. Yeah, and we're, we're disregarding that anything's in the middle. Of the way. Yeah. So there's, there's other states. But let's look at each, we're going to call each of these a macro state. How many micro states are possible for each of these? So to do that, we need to identify which atom is which. So we're going to label them 1, 2, 3, and 4. The atoms are identical, but 
they are different atoms, right? So we, we have to say, well, here for state A, um, the microstate, a microstate might be atoms 1, 2, 3, and 4 all on this side. Are there any other microstates? No. Because the only possibility is all four of them on one side. So this macrostate has one microstate. Macrostate B, where all the particles went to the other side, we also only have one microstate. All four particles, one, two, three, and four, on the right side. So only one microstate is possible. Any questions? Yes? So the way they're arranged doesn't matter? Like, one is in the top left corner, and then one goes to the bottom right corner. That's correct. We're not, we're not concerned with whether one is above or below number two. We're, we're keeping it very, very simple, and we're just looking at, is it on the left flask or on the right flask? Good question. So then let's look at C. Here's microstate, macrostate C. C, this one has six different microstates. Because you could have one and two on the left and three and four on the right. Two and three on the left, one and four on the right. One and three on the left, two and four on the right. This is a little like taking pictures at a wedding, right? You have to get all the possible combinations of all the people in the wedding party. And it just goes on forever. But these are all the possibilities of how you can arrange four different particles between two places. So there are six microstates. Each of these gives this result, two on each side. There's more than one way to get two on each side because you look at which particle is in which position. So the probability of finding the atoms in this state is six times greater than finding it in state A or state B because there are six different ways of arranging the atoms that you can come up with that. Does state C have more or less entropy than A and B? It has more because there are more microstates. More microstates means more entropy. If we increase the number of atoms from 4 to 20 and look at state C where we have 10 atoms on each side, now the number of microstates goes up to 184,756. What? It's a huge jump. 20 atoms. We, we never do anything with a sample that small. You increase the number of atoms and it just, it grows and grows and grows. What if we have state A or state B with 20 atoms? How many microstates? Still just one. So as the number of particles increases, the amount of entropy increases tremendously. So we can look at delta S for this, the change in entropy going from state A to state C. So S final, that's the entropy of the state in which the atoms are distributed between both flasks. That's larger. Minus the initial, the entropy of the state in which all atoms are in the same flask. That's where it started out, all the atoms in the left flask. We open the stopcock, and because this change from A to C causes an increase in entropy, it's a spontaneous process. And what have we learned about gases? Do they sit in the bottom of their container? They expand to fill the container. Entropy explains why. Why do they do that? When those atoms were confined to one flask before we opened the stopcock, their energy is also confined. When we open the stopcock and the atoms are allowed to disperse, then the energy also disperses. So the atoms are spread out 
their energy is spread out over a greater volume. And that also goes along with increasing entropy. Second law of thermodynamics explains things that the first law doesn't explain. So if we think about um, ice and water, you put ice in the water, and what happens temperature-wise? Well, the temperature of the water goes down, right, until it gets to the same temperature as the ice. And then the ice, say the ice started out at like minus 10 degrees Celsius, and the water started out as 20 degrees Celsius. The water's going to cool down. The ice is going to warm up because heat is going to flow from the warmer substance to the cooler substance. Why doesn't it go the other way around? Why couldn't you have the ice getting colder and the water getting warmer? That would be an exothermic process for the ice, wouldn't it? At heat leaving? What about the energy? When, when, no, in here. If, if this was to get colder and this was to get warmer, then we would be concentrating energy in the water. When the water becomes colder, the ice becomes warmer until they become the same temperature, we have a dispersal of energy. It happens that way because the entropy increases. Going the opposite way, entropy will decrease. And that doesn't happen. Changes of state. As a sample goes from a solid to a liquid, we call that melting, or from a liquid to a gas, vaporization or evaporation, the entropy of the matter increases. So informally, we can look at pictures and say, oh yeah, well, it's becoming more disordered. Here they're all lined up in nice little rows. Here they're kind of squishing and wiggling all around. And here they're just flying off in all directions, right? This is, this is more random. So an informal understanding is great, but we also need to be able to think about it more formally. So formally, there are more energetically equivalent ways of arranging the particles in the gas state. So in the solid, these are all going to be very close together. Um, and they're going to have to be in rows. And so it's not that there's one microstate. There are many microstates. But if you look at the gas, there are many, many more microstates for the gas. Have, have it having the same energy, but we can have a lot more variation in the kinetic energy of the particles and where they are. So the entropy of a gas is much higher than that of a solid and the liquids in the middle. Another thing going on is that a gas has more ways to distribute its energy than a solid does. If we look at a solid, the movement of a solid is limited to vibrations. Okay, so did I talk about solid? I didn't. Solid liquid state of students, because we don't cover the phases of matter in this class. So you guys right now are in the solid state. You are not moving relative to each other, right? But you're moving. You're fidgeting, taking notes. Hopefully everybody's breathing, blinking, right? And tapping their foot. When are we going to be done? But you're limited to moving, movement sitting on your stool, right? And that's what these solid particles are doing. They can't move relative to each other. If we look at a gas, now we have translational energy. But aside from, they could still vibrate, but they can also move. And so they could be moving a student running across the classroom, right? Or flying. Wouldn't that be fun if we could fly? Flying across the, ga the classroom, and we also have rotation, turning around. Now, you guys have swivel stools, so you could rotate, but, but solids can't do that. So 
there's more ways to distribute its energy, that increases the number of microstates. Because we could have a microstate with this one rotating and that one translating, or vice versa. And there's two, two microstates right there. So we say that a gas has more places to put the energy. The more places you have to put the energy, the more microstates there are, the greater the entropy. So we can predict the sign of the change in entropy, delta S. So entropy increases for each of these uh, processes. Phase transition from a solid to a liquid, going from a more ordered to a less ordered phase. Phase transition from a solid to a gas, same thing. From a liquid to a gas, the entropy will increase. And an increase in the number of moles of gas during a chemical reaction. So let me just make something up here. So let's say we had this water going to, um, I can't write today, H2O, 2H2O, 2H2 plus O2. There, I got it straight. Two water molecules in equilibrium with two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. There's more moles of gas here, more particles. What happened with our little analogy where we went from four particles to 20 particles? The number of possible states went through the roof, right? So that's going to happen here as well. If you have an increase in the number of moles of gas during a chemical reaction, that means that delta S is going to be greater than zero. So let's look at our only example for today. Predict the sign of delta S for each process. So A is going from a gas to a liquid. Delta S will be less than zero, right? Because we're going from less ordered to more ordered. We're also going from a larger volume to a smaller volume. We're concentrating the energy into one place. And we're also losing the number of places that we can put the energy. We're losing the translational and rotational um, energy. Solid carbon dioxide sublimes. That's greater than zero. Going from a solid to a gas. And that's a spontaneous process. How about this one? Greater than zero. Why? We're increasing the number of gas particles. We started with two, we end up with three. Entropy increases. You start with two children, you end up with six children. The entropy in your house increases. I can show you pictures to prove it. Any questions? That's the end. Oh, happy day.